All right, folks, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're about to get started. Um, some of you who may not know, my name is Dr. Alfonso Ferguson. I am gonna be our host today. And due, due to the time frame that we have allotted, I'm gonna jump right in and talk a little bit about what this webinar series is gonna be focused on, as well as allow our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. So this panel is you know, focused on how black male counselors, counselor educators are intentionally using mentorship to build community, provide guidance and create safety for other black men in counseling and counselor education. Specifically, our hope is to learn a little bit from our amazing panelists on what are their mentorship styles or what are their even unique experiences being mentees and mentors in the counseling world. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and popcorn and kind of have us start to introduce ourselves. And once we do that, we'll jump into a few housekeeping stuff um, and then jump into our questions for our panelists today, okay? So I'm, I'll, I'll jump to Dr. Nadrich because you're top of my list. You wanna go ahead and introduce yourself, sir? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Tyson Anderich. I'm Associate Professor of Counseling at Mercer University. Um, I'm also a licensed professional counselor or the equivalent in New York and uh, probably soon to be Georgia. I should probably do that and get that whole thing settled. Uh, board cert uh, National Certified Counselor, Approved Clinical Supervisor. Um, I'm an educator. I'm a clinician. Um, I love being both, if I'm being honest. And uh, I also value the role of mentor and mentee um, greatly. I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't receive the mentorship that I did, uh, specifically from uh, one person I'm looking at in this room right now. Um, so I'm always happy to give it back and always happy to talk about that. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks, folks. How about you jump in, Dr. Challenger? Thank you. I'm Dr. Chloe Challenger. I am an assistant professor of uh, counseling in the school counseling program uh, at Montclair State University in Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, former school counselor, particularly urban school counselor, where I worked in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, the Bronx, and also uh, in Harlem, New York City. So I have over 17 years working with kids, child, and adolescents. And I'm also a former athlete. So I think a lot of my mentoring comes from my playing background and my coaching background. That's kind of how I instruct my classes as well. So, um, you know, being here, mentoring and guidance has been such a big part of who I am and why I'm here. And I've been present with all my experiences of being mentored and guided. So I always knew that that's something I wanted to offer to others. Hence why I became a school counselor and why I currently train school counselors is so they can, they're basically mentors. So, uh, mentor is a big thing to me. It remains a big part of my personality and how I get forward and move forward. And uh, there's a person here as well who's been a big part of my mentoring journey. He's wearing a pink shirt. Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> So we'll talk about that later. So I'm happy to be here with all these gentlemen. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Challenger. Um, Mr. Levy? Yeah, so I'll go. Um, hey, y'all. My name is Richard Levy. You can call me Rich. Um, a little bit about myself. I am a mentee with somebody in, uh, I think it's gold, and maybe a little yellow and tan shirt, you know, looking like Slava Vamente, just out here doing his thing. <laughs> and just a little bit about myself. Um, I also am um, amongst one of the younger individuals here, but love, I love it. Age knows no limits, no bounds. Graduated from UConn with my school counseling degree. Um, went back to school, got my um, certificate to do professional counseling, and I'm currently waiting for my LPC now, but they tend to take their time when it comes to everyone. So waiting for my license to come in. I do private practice counseling currently, and with a, um, a couple of different individuals, I've done group counseling, worked with individuals and a nonprofit through counseling, and played a little football as well. Great mentor here that also has an athletic connection and, you know, good people. Gotta love it. And I'm happy to be here. Perfect, perfect. Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Gonzalez, born and raised in New York. Uh, this is, I think, year 23 or 24. I've lost count at this point in education. And for the past 
decade plus, I've been working at a school named Unity Prep in Brooklyn. If middle school and a high school, I'm honored to say that I played a role in helping start both of them. Um, that was when when I was younger and much more energetic and so idealistic, I didn't know what I was getting into. I just needed to get into it. Um, and so at the intersection of just needing to get into it and knowing I didn't know what I was doing, I met Dr. Challenger. And that was a fundamental change for the good in my career and my life. I think he's been instrumental in my practice. He's been instrumental in helping me develop the ways that I think about um, my work and since meeting him at Unity, I'd started the Department of Academic Counseling. I'd started a multi-year sequence of courses and experiential learning opportunities for students at our high school. And I started and run our alumni success program. Um, I've uh, both been a mentee, as I mentioned, of Dr. Challenger. And I also mentor other school counselors and school leaders who support those counselors um, in my new line of work. I've re recently relocated from Brooklyn to Atlanta, which is different. Maybe we can talk about that. Um, but as part of that work, I've become a coach for school counselors and, and school administrators. Um, and so I, uh, this is a bit of a full circle moment for me as well, in that I've gone from and continue to be a mentee, um, but I'm also um, now stepping into the wonderful experience of mentoring others doing this work. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. You sound real busy. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, we got Dr. Vereen. Up to no good. Um, let's see. I am Linwood Vereen. Uh, greetings from the Pacific Northwest. I'm at Oregon State University. Much like the good Mr. Gonzalez, I have no idea sometimes how long I've been doing this. It's been over 20 years. Um, and much like you, I'm in a really unique position. First of all, hello to my fellow UConn alum, uh, born and raised in Bridgeport, Connecticut, two degrees from the University of, and was a student athlete there back in the Stone Age. Um, it's interesting seeing all of these faces and, again, greetings. Um, I'm at a little bit of a loss for words, which is unique for me. But like as I was saying, I'm in a unique position in that I... I was entered into this by people who cared, um, who mentored me. And I see it as being cyclical. And one of the things I feel like I learned along the way is to continue to be open to that process. And so as I'm looking at some of these faces, I see people who I also consider to be my mentors. And that's what I mean by it's cyclical. Many of the faces you see on the screen are folks who, while they may be junior to me in terms of chronological age and years in the profession, I still have learned so many things from them. And so I think that's the unique part about the idea of being mentored. So I completely echo the idea of age boundaries, no, and to li no limitations in terms of opening yourself up to learning with and from other people. Um, and I think that perpetuates a true cycle of mentoring. I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Vereen. While we got you, you know, you're off mute. I'm gonna lead you into the first question because I do think you speak a lot about, actually before I do that, I'll do some really brief housekeeping. Um, just wanna remember, remind everyone, especially for our attendees to make sure that you're on mute. Um, at the end of our session, there'll be opportunity for questions and answers. So that's that'll be a great time for you to put yourself off of mute and ask your question. Please definitely utilize the chat during this experience to ask specific questions to different presenters or panelists, or even just ask general questions that we can either get to at the end or you know, between us presenters and, and panelists, we can use the chat to respond to questions as well. Just want a quick reminder that you will earn one CEU by being in attendance today. At the end of our webinar and within the last five minutes or so, we'll share a survey link that you'll need to complete in order to earn your one CEU credit. Um, and please allow the professional development team about a week or two to be able to get that certificate out to you. Um, now that we've gotten all the work out of the way, let's get into the real stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. So going back to you, Dr. Vereen, you actually mm -hmm. started to talk about like mentorship being cyclical, which yes. I think that's a really good point. And my immediate thought was, you know, one of the questions we have is what informed your mentorship, your mentor identity or even mentorship identity? Oof. That's a good one. 
Um, Charlie Adams, who was a staff member at the Jerome Orchid Boys Club in Bridgeport, Connecticut, I would say was one of my first. Before him, I'd probably say my mother. From there, fast forward to Don C. Locke, who was a faculty member at North Carolina State University. And uh, when I met him, I was at a business meeting and he shared some really simple words with me that led me to believe I have a place in this profession. And it was about after about a day and a half of me saying nothing, he just looked at me and said, Limit, are you going to have an opinion at all this weekend? And then from there, he went on to continue to support me personally and my career as well. But the thing that I think about is he supported me personally first. And one of the things that I feel like he created was the idea of do not, or I work to try to avoid saying, hey, just call me when you need something. And he instilled in me among a few other people, the idea of reaching out, don't, don't wait. Um, Cause if you really are interested in supporting and finding out what makes or helps people to advance to who they dream of being, you reach out. And so many of the faces on here, every once in a while, their phone rings and they get a call and it's like, Hey, where are you in the world? Is a question I always ask. And then we kind of get into the what's important to talk about. And it doesn't have to be the work. And oftentimes it's not the work that we talk about first. It's literally with certain people on the screen, where are you in the world? Because y'all be traveling. And also it's meant to just explore where are you in your journey? Um, and so those are some of the things that have led me to this. And then coming into contact with other really special people like a Michael Hannon, who set up a really good mentoring community uh, environment by inviting a group of folks to engage in scholarship. And this January was the first year in eight years that we did not have this specific retreat where a group of black men got together, faculty, doctoral students. Um, and the first order of business is community and fellowship. Work happens, but work happens second. Uh, and so I think those are things that stick with me and that, um, guide me in, in my way of being. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Vereen. I'm curious to hear from others in, in our panel right now, but one of the things that is really sticking out for me that you shared, Dr. Vereen, is the person-first experience in mentorship, mm -hmm. right? Not necessarily focusing on the word, but focusing on who you are, how are you, how are mm -hmm. things going, you What's know, going you on? good? Yeah. <laughs> and then from there, we can get to the work, or eventually we'll get to the work. Because the work's always going to be there. Yeah, are we just jumping in? Yep, go yeah. for it. You know, to uh, to ping pong off of Linwood, you know, I'm going to say what informs my mentorship identity as well. And a big part of that was my upbringing. You know, I grew up a uh, single parent with other siblings. And I saw my mom ask for help, you know, and that was my first model of seeing someone, strong person, realizing can't do it all by myself. And we asked the community for help. And then that kind of spilled over into when I was going to school, you know, asking for help because we had moved uh, to the States. So when you, when you, you know, we're still a U.S. citizen, but when you immigrate from somewhere, you're just kind of lost, you know, so you learn to ask for help or you get nowhere. Um, so that stuck with me uh, throughout my academic career and as a person, as I evolved, is asking for help. And then even being a student athlete, you hear me mention that before, you know, you can't get good at a sport <laughs> if you don't take the coaching and if you don't know what you're you're doing bad as an athlete, you, you ask the coach. You know you gotta, and you know we have a couple of athletes here. You gotta ask, hey, what am I doing wrong? Because I want to play. You know, so that habit of asking for help really stuck with me. And then every time I asked for help, I saw an advancement. I saw something improve. You know, I either got more opportunities or I got a door, foot in the door. But I realized that not asking for help made me stay stuck in place. You know, stuck like Chuck. You know, so. That became my personality of, you know what, Louis, don't reinvent the wheel, you know, um, which I took. I grew up in Western Mass as well, which is a predominantly white area. And, you know, in my adulthood, I started looking at the white community. And I said, hold up. They do it. They ask each other for help. They build uh, legacies for each other. They network with each other. And in order to get to the next level, you know, and that really stuck with me as well. I'm, I'm saying, you know, why? Why? Or is my community keeping our mouths shut? Why are we being so uh, prideful um, when we're seeing other races and cultures 
be more successful by saying, hey, I got you. I'll, I'll get you into this internship. I'll get you into this so on and so forth. And they build that network. And I'm, I'm observing this. And I'm like, this is no secret. <laughs> this is not a secret. Um, and then that's what became part of my mantra when I mentor people is, you know, your key is to ask for help. And to this day, I have mentors, no matter how old I, I am. And I get because it's worked for me. Um, and that's just been big for me. And, you know, we'll talk more about it, but just to kind of go on further, what also informed my identity is when I was in the workforce, having some bosses and supervisors that were not good leaders and not good supervisors and knowing that I needed guidance and I wanted guidance and they were unable to, to give it. So they were either in that role because they were senior or they were just there longer or whatever, but they weren't ready to lead and give guidance. And that upset me because I wanted to be better or be effective in whatever I do. So, um, and I'll talk more in the future about me being an existentialist helper, you know, talking about um, meaning and purpose. And that's how I live and move to the earth. So I found it to be a quality way to move to the earth. People may disagree, but when I talk to others and I'm asking them about what's your meaning and purpose, what's your motivation, that seems to resonate more, you know, and as I recently wrote an article before, it said, as a school counselor, I, I trained counselors to ask, not just what do you want to be, but who do you want to be? And that really revol revolutionized how people start to think about not just their careers, but how they walk on this earth. And then they think about, well, what career do I want based on who do I want to be? So that all informs my mentorship. And as like I said, as this webinar goes on, I'll talk more about that, but I'll... Uh, and I just want to piggyback off of Linwood. I'm going to piggyback off of you too. <laughs> so just going to keep piggybacking on. Um, but again, different stage, more of a mentee than a mentor. I have some individuals who have told me that they look up to me, left me as um, solidified as you're my mentor. Um, so similar to a bunch of people I've talked to, even on this panel, grew up in an urban environment, grew up in Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, born in Jamaica, so totally different upbringing um, and very family oriented, but grew up with my grandma. Dad wasn't really there. And when you grow up, you grow up around people that look like you, but then you learn very quickly of who you want and don't want to kind of be around. And as I'm navigating this world, I would say by myself, because my Jamaican grandma has no idea what you're going to going to school. And as we're continuing on, I go to these schools and I'm finding individuals I'm calling my mentor. So I'm forming these connections based off of, as Dr. Challenger said, I, I, you can kind of help me. Not in the financial realm, or anything, but more so in the mental space. Can you assist me in getting out of here so I can further my education for one, but just be here as a Black figure, a Black male figure, and can kind of show me the ropes because I have no idea what I'm doing here. And then transitioning from that to then going to um, University of Connecticut, where again, PWI, and one thing they don't tell you, what I didn't know, is, again, I played football in, in college. You walk on campus and you still feel like, I don't really feel like I belong here. But there aren't that many people here that kind of look like me outside of my sport. So what led me to that, again, um, the individual I continue to speak to today even from high school, that connection that stays, that connection that maintains and wanting to find that like-minded, who can I really be around that makes me feel like I am worthy and I do belong here. This is this is a beautiful bandwagon of uh, family leadership and example. So I'll, I'll continue that theme. Um, and it, it's most accurate for me because my parents both lived uh, beautiful lives of servant leadership. Um, both of them were politically active during their college days and then after. And although my father died when I was 11, um, my mother continued carrying that flag of servant leadership throughout her career and continues to do that now, even though she's 74 years young. Um, and so throughout my life, I grew up with I grew up with this incredibly powerful example of somebody who worked in schools, was a therapist, licensed clinical social worker, and she um, had a private practice at, and during certain years when she could sustain that work along with her practice in schools as an administrator. And she was just going so incredibly hard for families, for students, for the community at all hours, all days of the week. And 
that lit a fire in me. And I saw that example from her and my father, and I wanted to do the same exact thing. And so when I got uh, into college, I started to create and facilitate programs to help bridge the gap into post-secondary education for students from Washington Heights, where I was born and raised, or Bushwick, or uh, predominantly communities of color in New York City and communities that are less wealthy and pretty consistently disempowered by our society. Um, but what I realized, especially when I started Unity in 2013, was that you can have all of the urgency in the world and you can be so incredibly committed to this work, but you owe it to students and families who you serve to do the work well. It's not just a matter of you wanting to do it. It's a matter of you owing it to them to do it as well as you possibly can. And that's the point at which I realized I need to get some support to learn how to do this work. I'm committed to it. This is my life's work, but I need to figure out what exactly I'm doing so that I do right by these kids. And that's where um, I, I met Chloe and he was able to help me uh, improve my practice, but also ask and wrestle with some really hard questions. Um, because up till then, almost 15 years into my career, I was intense Mr. Gonzalez and I was just loving these children into a specific direction that I thought was right for them. And through some tough love and, and good education, Chloe helped me understand a very different framework for helping to students develop their own agency and, and respecting that. Um, and I'm, I'm proud to say that we were able to adjust our model of post-secondary counseling at my school. Um, and at all the levels, we were able to employ um, that uh, sort of framework where students were actually the leaders and, and the creators of their own fates and destinies. Um, and there are some students who, uh, in some cases, might have taken a step I wouldn't have prescribed for them, but they own it, and they have owned it, and they've lived the lives that they want to live, which, given our society and what Black and Brown youth uh, have to deal with uh, in every second of their lives, that's perhaps the most beautiful thing one can experience. So... For me, as a mentee, but also moving into this space as a mentor, um, I want to make sure that folks are able to take their, their, their gusto for this work and their motivation for it and combine it with successful ways that are based on more than your personal experience, your drive to do this work well. Um, and as a coach, I also want to make sure that folks know that they can do this work um, because this work is so laden with responsibility and um, if we come up short, if we do something that isn't 100% right, um, folks' lives are at stake, uh, literally and figuratively. And so I want to make sure that although that is a, a very huge, heavy weight uh, for folks to bear, um, that they should get into this work and they should learn how to do it well. Um, and so uh, that's the, the latest step for me is, again, mentor, mentee, trying to bridge that gap between the, the urgency and motivation, skills, and um, just motivation and empowerment. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, fellas. Um, I heard so many gems there. I, I hear, like, the importance of community. I hear the importance of making it cyclical, right? You know, each one, teach one looking ahead, but also pulling the folks from behind or the next generation up. Also hear the important influence of like family that kind of informs some of your mentorship styles or even culture, right? Being immigrants and navigating like the American terrain and whatever that may mean as it pertains to your various identities. So I hear so many things and thank you all for sharing. I wanna ask my mentees and I know we're all mentees, but I wanna push, push the next generation to the front a bit. How do you all approach seeking or engaging with the mentor? How do you find, how did you find your mentor? It's a full-time job as, as far as I'm concerned. I, again, have starting a school, like I'm, I'm, since I just stepped down and moved, I'm coming off of 10 plus years of 60 hour work weeks and, and, and that much more. Um, and one of the mainstays in my career has been asking for help as, as everyone has said so far. Um, I think one of the other things that I've learned to do a bit better as years have gone on is knowing what I don't know so that I can try to target my requests for help. Um, 
case in point, since he's here, when Cluey um, volunteered for a career fair, our first uh, career fair, I think seven years ago, he came in and was like, hey, what do you need me for? And I was like, actually, I heard you're a professor. Here's what we're trying to do. Can you help me figure out how to do this work well? And that I think is a much more practical question. Um, and, and it's more actionable, I, I think, from the perspective of the mentor uh, than like, I don't know what I'm doing, like, help me. You should still say that if that's the case, right? And you feel comfortable. But if you can target it uh, to, to something that's a bit more actionable for the mentor, I think that that's going to be, a, uh, it's more fruitful for the mentee. And I think it, it's um, more actionable for the mentor. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Nadridge. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, so I'm I'm hearing all these. Uh, you know, I'm in. I think I'm in an interesting position here because I'm here with one of my mentors, and also one of my mentees couldn't make it today. So it, it was interesting. I'm in an interesting position where I'm sort of, I, I guess, somewhat similar to some of my colleagues, where I'm in the middle of some ways. Um, but you know, I think the way I've been trying to find my the way I've been approaching mentorship and mentees is actually very similar to the way that my mentors found me was intentionally. Um, my mentors sought me out. My mentors, you know, it wasn't passive, it was active, which is what I hear the common theme is that there's this active mentorship. You know, uh, Linwood earlier mentioned uh, Dr. Michael Hannon. When I met him at Montclair State, he sought me out. Um, I think this actually proceeded. I was, I, I, there was there was another gentleman who I met. He did a guest lecture at Montclair State when I was in a class, and he and he was a black man. And when he saw me at the end of class, he literally walked up to me and said, "Let me get your number." We hadn't said a word to each other, but he said, "Let me get your number." And he called me later that day so we can talk, um, and that stuck with me. Uh, I mean, till this day, because you know I'm in a new position now, and I'm I'm hearing uh, Eric talk, and we got we got to talk because I'm a recent New York transplant down to Atlanta also, so I think we should talk. Um, but now that I'm at a different institution, where you know I'm coming from a very small institution to a large institution now, master's programs, doctors pro doctoral program, when when I see brothers, when I see other folks, it's it's not passive it's not that that thing we heard before it's not let me know i can help you it's hey let's get a meeting in the calendar now like that's what it is it's, let's put it in the calendar now and that's been my approach and it's been you know I, I think it's been effective some folks will really gravitate to it i've already made a few connections at my short time um at, at mercer so far and others you know, they, they, they get what they need and that's fine like it's, it's about meeting them where they're at but i've been as active in approaching mentees or that relationship um, as folks have been active with me. And, you know, I, I, I wanted to say one other thing, because as I heard this, you know, Dr. Ferguson, you were reflecting on the themes that we heard earlier. And the theme I really wanted to highlight with, was authenticity, um, you know, and I can't help but connect it back to, you know, we, we a few of us co-authored a paper called Home Place about Bell Hooks' concept of home place. My one of my current mentees, we just did a conference together, his first conference ever, and a lot of lessons that I learned along the way. You know, I put him up in a room. I made sure he didn't have to worry about anything other than just getting there, just get there, and everything else be taken care of. All that stuff is covered. But I remember we had a really important conversation. I think it was about a couple of days before we flew out there. He was like, "What should I be wearing?" And I was like, "Oh shit, I know this, this is a good. It's a good question." But what I fostered, what I told him was, I said, wear what you think is authentically you and know that no matter what you show up as, I'm with you, right? And that to me was such a powerful moment, hearing it in his voice. Like he literally had like this giant sigh of relief. Like I don't have to do this other thing. I can just be, and I can just show up and I can be me. So authenticity, it's connected to my clinical work where I started to learn what mentorship was. I think it's connected to the relationships that I have with folks here. It's all grounded in authenticity because the moment you can kind of release that weight, I don't have to pretend, I don't have to do that thing. You know, we can put the work second. We can just exist for a little bit. I think that's so central to mentorship. I'm gonna jump in here for a hot second. Um, one of the reasons 
I said yes to being a part of this is because I was asked by someone who I've grown to love and care about. And then the other is because, and that would be Dr. Ferguson. The other is because he allowed me to do, like, make a demand. And it was to be in a room with someone who I consider to be a mentor to me who is so much younger than me in terms of chronological and time of the profession. And so I remember meeting Dr. Nadritz and thinking after a long series of conversations, this man's mind is just crazy in all the best possible ways. And I knew when I met you then, I mean, I met the both of you then, that I, if I would like be quiet, pay attention and listen, there was going to be a lot that I learned. And I, to this day, I'm still just amazed. We talked, was it last week or early this week about an idea that Dr. Nadrich had, he was just running it by me. And I was just floored by the depth of this really, what seemed like a simple concept, but the depth that he put into it and the inclusion of me into this conversation, not only is just a sounding board, but like, does this make sense? And like, it was just incredible. And so I would be not getting the best out of not only my career, but more importantly, out of my life if I don't take moments to like really listen to what this man has to share, what he has to offer, and then witness how he exacts this with other people. Janice, who's a person many of you will never meet, used to talk about presence and how when you walked into a room, people know you're there. That's Dr. Nadris, and that's just how his mama raised him. I don't know. I wasn't there. But it permeates because I've watched him interact with some of his students, and I was privileged to, like, literally be a fly on that wall and just watch him do what he does and nurture and care for. I remember this one student. It was at the thing in New York at Columbia, Teachers College. This young student was freaked out, nervous as all get out. And I'm watching this individual just care for this person first about them and then about the work. Like, you got this. We got this. You're ready. And then supporting this young person and then seeing how this person reacted in the moment. Like, they stood up when they presented. Like, they brought real, like, all of themselves when they presented. And it was just such a really cool thing to watch it unfold. And I think that's what, if we're not paying attention to, we miss it's just an opportunity to witness, to learn, and then to figure out what ways does that work for me? And then how might in some small way I be able to do that for another human being? I mean, it's hard to follow that, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, again, um, well, my mentee during that thing began when I was in, again, middle school and even prior to that elementary because they're still – um black mentors who I speak to this day that were my um counselors, my teachers in middle and elementary school. So you do form these lasting bonds with people who look like you. And that's one thing that I've always gravitated towards, which is I want to find people that look like me and that can understand in any any sliver of a way of what it means to be me and what it means to be them, because we share that part. Outside of me being in Jersey, once I got to UConn, um, how me and um, Dr. Challenger got connected again, we're both former athletes that like mindedness. I walk into his class one day and I was like, I like this guy. <laughs> a good guy. We we're both former athletes. Um, the way that his motivation, so we have the same mindset, that determination, that drive, and that focus. Mm -hmm gravitated me towards, okay, I think this would be a good person to fit with. And the future aspect within Dr. Challenger, I saw that he could get me to where I would need to be, not by doing anything for him, but just by being him and me picking his brain, him being that wealth of knowledge that I can obtain information from. And then just blossom into this mentor menteeship that we have now. But when you're in this sea at UConn and you find that one glimmer of hope i latched onto it and definitely again fruits of labor pays off and we're still mentor mentee to this day awesome thank you so much for sharing 
not only the personal stories, but the insight as to like how you all go about finding your mentors and mentees. I think what I hear, what I'm pulling out of it is for a lot of us, some of it felt like happenstance. And for some of us, it was really intentional. Like I saw this person, I knew that they're where I wanna be or they can support me and get in there and they're willing to be a help and be a support for that. So like there's almost this go-getter mentality that's associated with connecting with someone as well. Um, this this one for my my mentors specifically, and I know we're all in this space. We are all mentors, so everyone is fair game for anyone to answer. Um, what strategies or would you say tools do you employ as a mentor? What is important for you to be? What what ingredients essentially is important to be a part of the mentorship experience for you? All right, <clears throat> I will jump in because I, I you know I thought about this and this is this is really great. Um, to tools that I use, uh, a big part of it is my my personality is a helper. You know, I, I don't use the word counselor or therapist very often. What I say, helper. You know, I teach my students to be helpers. Um, you want to help people, and you have a skill. But I, I look at how I was helped, you know, and for those that care, I'm a Taurus. All right, <laughs> so Taurus, we're really present. We're hard workers. Yeah, you know, we're stubborn. Whatever you can add, you can throw that all in there. But <laughs> but. But one thing about a tourist is that we try to be present. You know, green is green, red is red, brown is brown. Um, and what that allows is for uh, a pretty direct conversation, pretty realistic, um, pretty rational. It doesn't mean we're smart. It just means, you know, I'm speaking for all tourists out there. <laughs> no, it just means you get a person that's going to, you know, uh, real talk you. Um, and that's really important, but also be a motivator. So a lot of my mentoring is around all of those characteristics you know there's the fantasy world there's the aspirational there's all of that and you want to keep that prominent in a person's mind but also what are the real actionable steps what are the resources that you have on you around you within you you know let's also tap into that because i always say i just don't like being in a room full of idea people it drives me nuts you know someone needs to be an executioner you know, an executioner with a room full of idea people, that's a beautiful thing. But a room full of idea people is just a bunch of conversation, you know? And to be a good mentor and to be to have your mentorship be valuable, there needs to be actionable steps and an action plan. And that so that means you're, you're as, as we've said before on this conversation, your mentor has to be intentional, not just let's come in and have a good conversation and it's a feel-good moment. So there's a big part to me that, that believes in intentionality. And and actually. Hang in there with me. All right. I actually wrote this down because I was like, man, I was, I was feeling myself. You know what I'm saying? I, so I wrote this, I wrote this down. It's 11 things. And ironically, I got C's out of it, all C's. It's, it's a little self-absorbed, all right? <laughs> but both my first and last names was C. But all right, so there's 11 C's, okay? And hang in there with me. I'll try to go as fast as possible. I think this is fruitful. <laughs> I'm lying. You put this in the chat <laughs> when you're done. All right. So one of the C's is, number one, uh, be consistent. You know, as, as a mentor, being consistent, uh, always being there, always trying to be the same uh, person and, and being predictable. Number two is being committed. You know, you commit to the relationship. Uh, you're going to be there, do as you're, you're asking. You, you know, you, you'll be there for the person and it'll be for you. Number three is be creative. You know, being mentor is being able to have, teach creativity and be creative. So teaching the person to think differently and providing non-traditional um, responses and reactions rather than the, the run of the mill. Another one is collaborative. That's really key. You know, being able to work together. I don't work for you. You don't work for me. We're doing this together. Therefore, you can have some ownership in your growth, you know, and accountability when you don't grow rather than it's your fault challenge that I didn't grow or that I did grow. It's no, it's, it's a collaborative effort. I don't know. Uh, tell me what you need. So it's, collaboration is key. Uh, another one is courageous. You know, that means having your mentee take risks and as a mentor, take a risk in how to approach your mentor, your mentee, you know, so being courageous is a key thing. And that leads to the other C, which is confrontational, not being afraid to be confrontational with your mentee, you know, and also take confrontation from your mentee, because you want to have a dynamic relationship of, hey, this is a real conversation. It's a real relationship. It's not top down. It's not hierarchical. This is collaborative, as I said, in my other C. All right. So but some people want to be a people pleaser. And they want to be really nice when that's not what growth is about. Growth hurts. Growth causes you to stretch, so I have to stretch you, and you'll stretch me. Uh, another C is consultative, or be a consultant. So there's times where your mentee is going to need you to 
get your insight on something, not to tell them what to do, but to bounce ideas off of you. So being a consultant is a, a role that we're also going to be in as well as how, you know, being able to process with them. How are you looking at this? You know, what resources do you need? What resources do you have? So not telling you what to do, but I'll give you a sounding board. Hang in there. A few more left. Okay. <laughs> Comprehensive. You know, really looking at the whole person holistically and trying to build a comprehensive program and plan of action. Once again, with all the resources, what you know about the person, what you know about what they have and don't have and what they can and can't do. So not just looking at one part of the person, but holistically, comprehensively, what can we do all around? And the last few is being communicative. If you're not a very good communicator, you, you don't use your words. For those of you that are parents out there, talk to your kids, use your words, all right? If you don't use your words, I don't know what you're thinking. I am, I, I use this joke all the time. I'm Cluey, I'm not Miss Cleo. That's for those of you that are over 40. All right. <laughs> I can't predict what you're thinking. And I have to teach you how to talk to me. I have to teach you how to be a communicator. And particularly, particularly as men, as black men, we are very dearth in that area. It's the deficit. So I have to teach how to talk and be comfortable talking. You're not boring me. You're not you're wasting my time. I need you to talk to me and, and uh, share with me and try to clarify your thoughts. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. And the more clear you get at being able to talk to someone. And the last two is being complimentary, saying, good work. That was nice. That was great. You know, complimenting the person that, that's a motivational feature um, rather than not showing love and not showing and recognizing that that person's doing well. And the last one is cultural identity understanding that that's a big part of who the person is, how they move through the world. So I can't talk to any mentee in a vacuum, you know, that their blackness, their brownness, their Asianness, that it doesn't matter. Their ethnic background doesn't matter. It does matter. It does govern decisions that they make, how they move through the world. So I need to incorporate uh, the cultural identity aspect in my mentoring. Um, and that all doesn't go one way. This is a mutual way. So I do this for myself. I ex also expect my mentees to recognize that about me. So I have to be open as well. Um, and it's and self-disclose is not just a one-way unilateral thing. So that's kind of my quick 11 points <laughs> of the C's that I want to share with everyone. And I'll, I'll turn it over. But that's kind of how some strategies and approaches that I use amongst other things. But I wanted to kind of make it um, clear if possible. Thank you, Dr. C. Yeah, you're going to have to put that in the chat. Um, Done. <laughs> you took, are you taking notes? <laughs> no, you have to do that, Dr. Chow. Let me ask you to do your work. <laughs> I already done it. I'm making it easy for y'all. I was in a conversation with Tice, and I, I see it. Uh, it was a text conversation, and he had recounted this thing that I think you said when, it was your grandmother who said to you, I need to put my eyes on you. That's a resource. So if we're anywhere within a parameter, I got to put my eyes on you. Like, so if we go to some conference, if we're not working together, we got to get some lunch. We got to have some beverages, whatever kind suits you. That to me is a big part. Um, I'm an old school, like I'm a phone call person. Texting, is I have to grow into. Uh, so let's say I have grown into. And so I make a lot of phone calls. And that's just how I, and I got to work in the time difference because I'm out on the Pacific Northwest. I got to factor in those three hours of like where people are and what they're doing. Um, and back to, I think your question, Dr. Ferguson was like, what are the other resources? I mean, that's one, it's it's contact. And I think it ties into Dr. Challenge's list of C's and it's connection. And it's that that thing that you picked up as a theme. I choose not to have a headstone when I die. But if I were to, nobody's going to put anything about that I had a PhD and all that other stuff. They're going to talk about the relationships, whether I was a decent person, human being, father, all that, somebody's lover, something like that. And those are the things that are the resources that I want to continue to draw upon. Jason Branch is uh, another young uh, sort of superstar in the profession, and he talks a lot about filling up, pouring, like you can't do this if your cup's not filled, like pouring out. And in mentorship, it is that. And so that's the other part why it, it's important. And I, I really appreciate, Clue, you hitting on this as well. Like, and all of y'all like that, it's, it's a cyclical relationship. It's a real relationship. And what that does is 
all the things that you may or some individual may think that Dr. Vereen at some point at one little time did something for them. One of my resources is also sharing with that person what they do for me. So that it's not singular. Like, this is how you moved me. This is what I've learned from you. This is how now I got to rethink everything about how I see this. Or, or telling folks, you've just jammed up my whole lecture for class because now I got to change it because you done added some stuff I wasn't thinking about. And that part is, is, is some days it's literally what keeps me. It is what holds me. Like, I know that I have this group of people and they think, oh, he my mentor. He's my mentor. And I think these are people I learn with. These are people I learn from. And these are people who I genuinely care for. And hopefully, in some small way, they understand those things. But I And I do think, Chloe, you were talking about this, about the communication piece, like being honest and being frank, like, this isn't working. Or this is what's dope about this. This is what has moved me. And those things are like those innate resources that just speak volumes. And they literally last a lifetime. I, I want to say something really quick, because I think there's I, I think there's something to highlight about relationships. We're talking about these factors and from the inside. Um, I'm gonna add a I'm a clue. I'm gonna do you if I'm gonna add a C for this one. I'm gonna say curiosity. We're gonna add. We're gonna make it number twelve. And the reason why I say that though is, I forgot both of those examples that Linwood just shared about mentorship and the impact. I I know who he's talking about at the Winter Roundtable at that conference, and I and I'm gonna share a story about her in a moment because you bringing her up brings it back to mentorship, and I forgot what my grandmother used to say I, you know my, my grandmother has since passed but I forgot that and the fact that he remembers that if anyone knows him when you meet Dr. Vereen the first thing that he does is he just asks you questions about you so he knows who you are and the fact that he remembers all of these things till this day even after I have done forgot them or at least put them somewhere else because of my sleep deprivation self because I have young children um that says that speaks volumes and the one thing that i will that i want to highlight because i don't think there's much to add here is something that really came to mind about mentorship like factors was fostering both freedom but also opportunity and what i mean by that is is you brought this up dr vereen when you mentioned that young woman who i worked with at that conference she is now in academia she got her doctorate and she is now on on the tenure track and when we talk about what she needed, when she was going through her dissertation, she said, I need you on this committee. And I said, in what way? And she said, well, I need you as a methodologist, but I also just need you. And I said, say less, I'm there, but done. I was on her committee immediately. And most recently, a couple of weeks ago, I checked in on her, I said, hey, what's going on with you? What's going on with your life? Everything along those lines, et cetera, et cetera. And she was talking about all these presentations that she's doing and all these webinars. And I said, good, how's your publications going? And she said, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. I said, here's a day, let's meet. And what we're going to do is either we're going to figure out what you're writing or you're going to get on something that I'm writing. Because for me, it's fostering the freedom and the opportunity. If she's not ready to take the lead, that's fine. We're going to figure, we're, we're going to get you done. Let's get you on something. Because that's the opportunity that was given to me was let someone got me on to something. So let's do that. You're going to, you're going to work we're going to get you onto this, or we're going to leave this meeting figuring out what you're working on and how I can support you. Um, so I, I'm thanking Dr. Vereen for reminding me of her because I just met with her. And and again, I'll just emphasize the fact that he remembers these things. is uh, it's, it's remarkable, but it's also impactful. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Nadrich. Y'all, I recognize we have five minutes uh, Mr. Gonzalez, I saw you went off mute, so I'm open to hear what you have to say. We got to make it a little brief. And while we're doing that, for folks, if you have questions, please feel free to share it in the chat. We have a couple more minutes. Let's see what we can get done. Uh, I appreciate making the time. Um, Chloe, I want to try to add a beautiful 13th to, uh, to your list. Let's go with concrete. 
Um, one of the things that I've learned in working with folks who are earlier in their career and what I've realized about my practice um, from earlier in my career, but also to this day, is that a lot of this work can be so incredibly aspirational. But for me, specifically in working in a school, you got to make it concrete. And you've got to make it so that folks who are delivering this work and serving students and families actually know what this work needs to look like in order for it to be impactful and meaningful. Um, and it can't be, I want to talk about return on investment and social mobility and debt to income ratios with our ninth graders so that they know this, you know, like the back of the hand by 12th grade, like that means nothing to kids. You got to make it meaningful. You got to make it concrete. What does that look like? How is it going to be delivered? How are you going to make sure that they actually get this stuff down in a way that's meaningful to them? Perfect, perfect. Thank you, folks. I'm wondering if we got any questions over the last couple of minutes. I haven't seen anything pop up in chat. Mm -hmm. Same, same. Um, one question that I have for everyone, and we can either put this in the chat or um, for, for, for the panelists, that is, is how do you balance doing this work, but also taking care of yourself at the same time? Because I think one of the things I think about with mentorship, it's like leading by example as well. Mm. And in the field that we're in, burnout is real. Mm. You know, I can answer real quickly. For me, I think that Part of it, well, it's, it's me. I tell students all the time to, you, know, you don't play counselor. It's in your DNA. So you're trained for it to be who you are rather than, let me put my hat on. Let me take it off. That's more exhausting. So I practice that myself. I think also by mentoring, I, I see it as how I can stay relevant as well. So when I'm mentoring other younger people or people that are different from me, I said before, it's collaborative, so I can learn from them, and therefore that I can learn what's new, what's hip, what's old. It keeps me relevant, not only as an educator, but also as a person. You know, it's a, it feels mutual rather than uh, unilateral. That's important to me because we all said before it's about connection. So if I can connect with someone else, I'm sharing energy, I'm sharing my life, we're sharing a timeline, and that's fulfilling to me. As an existentialist, that gives me meaning, purpose, and direction. So that energy shared is part of my wellness In not doing so, I, I feel almost lopsided. So I don't see mentoring as just giving to a person. I'm also receiving as well. And if I do it right, I should receive equally as I'm giving. So that's the thing about mentoring as well. If, you, if you're giving so much, you're exhausted, then I don't think you're doing it right. You know, I think that it needs to be fulfilling. Now, I always tell, tell people, don't pour into a bucket that has holes. Your water is rich. You know, so find a bucket that's going to hold your water because it's very valuable water. And that means we want to stay enriched. So, yeah, that's a good point. That's part of my wellness is when I connect to people, I want to make sure that we're mutually getting this energy exchange and we're benefiting from each other. Therefore, you're not, I call them LNLs. You're not leaning and leeching on me. You're not leeching my energy. You're not leaning on me, which is exhausting, you know? So that's part of my wellness as well. That reciprocal relationship also helps with that. And the sure. only thing I'll add after that is, They're family. Like I get to a point, you know, and I haven't talked, I realize like I ain't talked to Chloe in a minute. So then I start blowing up his phone and then we figure it out and something we'll find it. But it's like, and there's that energy there, but that's also reciprocated. And that's what fills me. That's what helps me avoid the any that burnout. Because there's, and these men can attest to this, they've seen me laugh, holler cry, all sorts of things. Um, we experienced the full range of emotion and relationship. Yep. I'll say that um, black male counselors are like black actors in Hollywood, just a few of them, right? And so if you don't have a mentor, you're doing this work in perhaps the hardest way and you're doing it in the loneliest way. So for me mm -hmm. as a mentee, um, and we've heard several folks mention this already, um, it's an amazing uh, support system um, and, and someone who, um, again, I'll speak about one of my mentors, Cluey, he, he's done this work. He's been in my exact position. He and I have several um, similarities in our background and, and upbringing and just lived experiences. And so there, there's an innate connection there that allows me to 
hear what he has to say, whether it's some of the tougher statements, that confrontational side um, that I know is always coming from love, but it's definitely confrontational, um, or mm -hmm. some of the things that are a bit softer around the edges. I can hear all of those things very clearly, and they all come as forms of support. Uh, and so as a mentee, I would say that that's something that's incredibly restorative and, and supportive for me. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you, fellas. Uh, if you don't, guys don't mind, I'd love to wrap up. I appreciate folks for hanging out for a few extra minutes. We got a couple of closing remarks that I wanna make sure that you guys get the information and have access to, as you may have seen in the chat. Um, Ms. Suni Sharma has shared the uh, CEU form. So please, free, please feel free and I encourage you guys so go ahead and click that form and complete the form so you can earn your CEU. As I mentioned before, you all will be receiving one CEU for attending this conference or this webinar. I'm at a conference, y'all, so I have a little bit of everything happening right now. Uh, we also have a couple of things coming up that I want to share with you all. CSJ has information on upcoming events that we'll share the link in the chat as well. And there's also the graduate school, graduate student showcase coming up. So if you guys are interested in participating in that, we'll drop the form in the chat. Um, and please feel free to join us. We, we have ACA coming up and CSJ have a couple of events happening during that time frame that you all are welcome to. So please be on the lookout for that information. You can check our social media handles as well as um, checking out the CSJ website. Other than that, I think we are all good to go. I appreciate you all for the time and energy. I see your hand up, Kyle. Feel free to hang out. If the folks on the panel are available and can hang out, they'd be more than happy to answer your question. But for now, I think I'm, I'm good to go. Enjoy your weekend, folks, and thank you all for a good webinar.